All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adrian, for the invitation. It was a wonderful short week. Unfortunately, I have to leave tomorrow. I wish I would stay longer uh, to keep working on, 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 on stuff that actually is only going to be touched uh, at the end of this talk uh, because it's mostly going to be uh, finite dimensional non dynamic stuff in relation to uh, golden ties. I'm going to get into that. That happened in the Caribbean Sea. Uh, it's going to be mostly nonlinear dynamics and insights or golden times or Caribbean Sea. But uh, this is what I have. So this is a collaboration with uh, people in a, in, a, in a pointer. It's not working. Or, well, with a number of people, uh, people in, in the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, they are affected by these golden tides. I'm going to get into that. Fernando, Andrade Canto, Gustavo Goni, and uh, Joaquin Trinante from NOAA, AML, and uh, a collaborator from uh, uh, Germany, uh, Daniel Karash, and Josefina Olajua. She's with me in, in Miami as well. This is work that is funded uh, after several attempts, uh, failed attempts by NSF. Fortunately, they're putting money to, to, to do work on this. Uh, and of course, this is not working. As they told me, it was supposed to be working. So I'm gonna have to, nothing is doing. We have to, but it was working. Oh, because I have to point where. No. If I, if I, if I, okay, now, can I go on? Yeah. All right. So this is uh, uh, the work that I'm presenting is it's, uh, it's based on a paper that's been published in Physical Fluid recently with these people. And, uh, and it has to do with the following. Uh, as you may know, now it's fine. As you may know, since uh, 2011, the issue of uh, invasions of, um, uh, uh, of a Caribbean Sea with this floating brown algae uh, has been pretty bad. And it's affecting the economy of the area since then more than 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 usual. The when I'm talking about this this uh, brown uh, seaweed that used to be uh, uh, distributed mostly in the uh, in what is called the Sargasso Sea, but for reasons that are not very clear. The, there are most of the uh, concentration happens to be along the, the uh, tropical Atlantic belt. And this is a satellite image of a concentration of sargassum, uh, recent, uh, anticipating a pretty bad uh, or active season in the Caribbean Sea. Um, uh, this is um, uh, the University of uh, South Florida, uh, specializes on 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 doing these things uh, based on satellite uh, images, and this is what they are expecting for the Caribbean Sea for the typical conditions in Tulum, in the uh, Riviera Maya. Maya, uh, it's a picture that it was provided for me by a colleague. Uh, so this pileup of um, of uh, of sargassum in the uh, in the beaches, uh, they call them. Uh, uh, golden tides because of the color that the water acquires. And I also, there's a double meaning because some people saw opportunity in these golden tides because it, this seaweed might be used for uh, uh, fuel or uh, even food or pharmaceuticals. But at the same time, um, they, they carry toxins and when they rot in, in, the, in the beach, and it could be uh, harmful for human beings. And of course, it's disrupting the, 
the economy of, of the area, all pe though people are starting to get used to deal with this. They go to the beach and they, they, they have to face this all the time. No? Um, from a positive side, uh, these things, uh, they can be a, a, a sequester carbon dioxide. So they can have a good impact in the uh, global climate. But at the same time, they can affect you know, the corals because they interrupt the, uh, uh, the uh, in, in, inflow of light that corals need to, to live. So there being a problem, and, uh, and, and the subject of this uh, talk is, is transport, actually. Uh, I don't, we don't know the reason why this is actually increasing. Uh, since 2011, people related to possible uh, land management in, in, in Africa uh, through wildfires. Uh, these fertilizers, phosphates, and these can be bring into the ocean, they can feed the blooms of, of this algae. Uh, but that is, is not unclear. The reasons why, why this is happening is, 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 are not clear. Uh, so the outline of the talk is going to be, I mean, let's start with an observation. And then I'm going to go with the issue of um, how uh, vortices are, are detected in, in oceanography. Um, this has to do with, with finite dimensional dynamic systems. Then I'm going to go over what we call the carriers which are the uh, vortices of a special type. They have a material boundary. So these are generalizations of KM tori uh, for the situation in which uh, you have a, a periodic time dependence in a, in, a, in, a, in a dynamical system. The cargo, which is the sargassum, the algae themselves, uh, is a higher dimensional dynamical system and a mechanism for coastal inundation. And we go into infinite dimensional dynamic systems. I'm going to start on with the conclusions. Okay, so this is this is the observation. This is the Caribbean Sea. Uh, what you see in the background is concentration of, of, of algae uh, to uh, um, uh, uh, frames at different times, 26 June of 2017 and 18 September. Uh, 2017. What I'm plotting on, on uh, orange in here and thick is uh, the boundary um, coherent material vortex extracted from a realization of the velocity field. And I'm going to go into, into there. Uh, and backward images under that flow of the same boundary and also forward images. Here, what you can see here is that there is sargassum penetrating this uh, boundary, which already uh, uh, presents a puzzle because these boundaries are supposed to be uh, uh, barriers for material. Well, sargassum is able to penetrate the boundary, these boundaries, get in, and as the vortices, I mean, are propagating. Through the Caribbean Sea, they become unstable and, and they contribute to spread the sargassum uh, along the coasts of the Yucatan Peninsula and also Central America. Okay, so, so I, I'm repeating a little bit what I just said. So there is this anti cyclonic, anti cyclonic meaning that is rotating uh, clockwise in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the northern hemisphere. A meso scale, we are talking about vortices of about 100 kilometer uh, diameter, diameter and, uh, and they have this special property of uh, resistance stretching the, the boundaries. Their material boundaries composed of same fluid particles all the time, but they resist stretching. This is the carrier. And you have the sargassum, the cargo, and uh, we have uh, this vortex that eventually becomes unstable and uh, and we want to give it a mechanism for that. We have called the, the vortex Kukulkan, which is a Mayan um, god. And for the particular shape, the vortex or the filaments take, I mean, this Kukulkan is depicted as a worthen snake by, by the Mayan Mesoamerican uh, culture. 
um, uh, so these filaments, uh, which are breaking away from Kukulkan and the contributing to spreading the sargassum and to the ghosts. Okay, this is a picture of the, of the complete life cycle of Kukulkan from its, uh, the, the day it, it, it was formed out of completely incoherent water in the Caribbean Sea, the time during which it remains as a coherent feature and eventually becomes unstable and uh, with all the filamentation, the picture of a uh, Kukulkan on the left hand, right side. I mean, uh, as assembles the complicated structure that uh, Vortex acquires. Okay, you have to note that uh, the Caribbean Sea, this region is deeper than in this region over here. So the topography or the depth is, uh, is decreasing toward the left or um, the west. And the interaction with topography has something to do with instability of these vortex. Okay, and I'm going there uh, soon. Okay, so how we extract the vortex. So we, we use what we call altimetry. I'm not sure of the background in, in this audience, but uh, altimetry, uh, since 1992 or so, there have been three or four uh, satellites with altimeters that are measuring sea surface height, roughly speaking, along track. And they can produce maps uh, from that. And then uh, through what is called the geostrophic balance, the sea surface height is basically a stream function, or if you want a Hamiltonian for a one and a half degree of freedom system. Okay. Um, these maps are provided uh, weekly and they have 25 kilometer resolution. They are used uh, uh, and, uh, routinely to detect what are called SSH eddies. I'm going uh, in the next slide to try to illustrate the issue with the de facto um, uh, technique for or uh, method for detecting vortices in oceanography. They just identify most oceanographers with close streamlines of the sea surface height. Uh, and in here, I'm showing a for exact solution of the two dimensional uh, Euler equation without, uh, no, with a two dimensional Euler equation, incompressible, uh, a instantaneous streamlines of that particular vector field. And I'm depicting, I mean, I'm painting in red, uh, the center in there. And if I click it here, you see that as you advect the, uh, the stuff inside, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, follow the, uh, the streamlines, okay? So what it appears to be a vortex is actually it's not a vortex. And the reason why it's not a vortex is I'm able to do this is the following one. So we have these instantaneous streamlines which are closed and then are all methods that you can run such as the Okubo Vice method instantaneously have rotation dominating over strain, you classify this region as a vortex. But if you switch to a rotating frame, you'll see what you have in there is actually a static uh, in that frame, a hyperbolic structure. So what you have in here is actually a rotating saddle. That's why the material inside is not retained inside a, a closed streamline. Um, and this was noted by George Haller in, in 2005. Uh, we've been uh, um, trying to uh, uh, deliver the idea that this should not be done for detecting vortices since uh, 2013 in collaboration with George and, and other people. Okay. I'll give you one example, a real example in the, in the, uh, in the ocean. So this is the Southern Ocean, and what I'm showing in there is an instantaneous streamline that is close and is classified as a nonlinear SSH eddy using this de facto a way of detecting vortices. And actually, in, there is a aviso is uh, the uh, uh, what, what the, the association that delivers the sea surface height uh, measurements. They have a 
a, a, a website in which they deliver these uh, extractions of, of, of nonlinear eddies. Uh, and I want to show you what happens with this one when you advect them. So the red thing is going to keep being coherent, but if you keep track of, of the boundary and advect through the flow, you see that it doesn't remain inside or around the, the, uh, the vortex. So this is not a vortex and couldn't be classified as a vortex. Okay, so there are, uh, we have devised techniques to uh, work around that problem. And the thing that we developed with, with George Haller is what we call um, uh, coherent material vortices. And the idea is that, uh, so there's a flow map, there's a vector field, you can compute a flow map. And this is the image of this initially round uh, loop. Uh, this is what we expect a, core, a coherent vortex to do. And in general, what you can expect to see is the formation of the initial boundary. Okay. And uh, how do we uh, detect these type of structures? So we go and 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 present a variational principle here. So we integrate the relative stretching over the loop. And uh, we look for extremizers of that. Okay, C is the uh, the Cauchy Green deformation tensor, which is an objective quantity, meaning that it's invariant under roto translation of a frame. So any any observer would uh, uh, see the same thing. And uh, what happens is that the solutions of this uh, variation of this extremization are loops which have the property of uh, each element of a loop stretches by the same amount P, e. okay? Uh, when P is equal to one, there is no stretching at all. And if the velocity field underlying two dimensional is incompressible, you have area preservation. So there are no stretching or reassumption actually of the arc length of the, uh, of the initial arc length after a period of time T plus incompressibility that makes uh, the object uh, very stable or, or coherent. Uh, we define a Lagrangian coherent vortex as the outermost uh, mem uh, uh, member of a family of, uh, of P-loops, okay? And then we, we, can, we can interpret these P-loops as no geodesics of a, a Lorentzian uh, metric and we have make an analogous an analogy with with black holes uh, and that is uh, uh, outlined here in 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 a in, in a paper in two papers with with George Haller in, in the geophysical fluid mechanics journal uh, and journal of fluid mechanics okay so uh, how we det detect these vortices of course this is more involved than just looking at instantaneous streamlines of a two-dimensional velocity, but you have to do many more things. So first of all, you have to have a realization of a velocity field that we use some symmetry in this case to compute. And then you have to um, compute a flow map. So we put initial conditions in some domain D and we construct a flow map. And with the flow map, we build a Cauchy green tensor and compute uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Okay. This P, these uh, closed loops that I already uh, talked about are solutions of a, of a line field that is given here. So a linear combination of uh, eigenvectors of the Cauchy green tensor with coefficients that depend on the uh, eigenvalues and, and the parameter P. Okay, this is what we call a line field because these are eigenvectors and eigenvectors do not have a global orientation. So this is not a vector field. Okay, so in the process of looking for uh, closed loops, we make use of the um, index theory for line fields, which extends the index theory for vector fields. So we have to look into um, uh, uh, singularities of the Cauchy Green tensor, and uh, and there are uh, objects that are analogous to uh, elliptic points and hyperbolic points that are called wedges and trisectors, they have different indices values. And um, so if the sum of all of the indices is equal to one, so the region in there 
is candidate for uh, fine for having a closed loop. So we then have to go in and take a Poincaré section in there in order to compute fixed points. And uh, and once you do that, you have a family of uh, of loops, and you retain the outermost one, and it gives you the boundary of the vortex. It's a price you have to pay in order to do things right. I mean, you have to go through all these steps. And on top of that, we extended this recently in this paper. This, the index theory is due to Karash with, 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 with collaborators and, and in here with Fernando uh, and also with, with, with uh, Daniel Karash. We, we extended this, this uh, algorithm uh, to search over the space of initial time some uh, coherent uh, uh, horizons in order to frame, uh, sorry about that, uh, uh, the genesis and the apocalypse of, 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 of the vortices. We have the complete history of, of, of the vortices since they are born until they, they die. Okay, and there are a few observations in here. Um, first of all, numerically, we see that coherent Lagrangian vortices are diffusion resistant as well. That is from numerical experimentation. And then we have the following that uh, these coherent Lagrangian vortices uh, admit uh, local maxima of the Lagrangian average vorticity deviation, this quantity here, which is the integral over time of the deviation vorticity with respect to the mean vorticity in the region that George Haller and collaborators have used to define the notion of rotational coherent vortex that have, that it was, they, they were observed to resist also filamentation. Um, we need that in order to, to, to come up with a, with, with, with a, with a formal uh, result for the, uh, uh, the role of, of, of these vortices with respect to material that floats in the surface of the ocean. Clearly, SSH eddies detected from the de facto um, technique do not possess any of these uh, uh, properties. Okay. And so now going to sargassum. So we have sargassum planning here. And this is how we uh, see sargassum from a mathematical point of view. So these are all floating particles that are connected by elastic bands. Okay. So, and the floating particles are moved around by, a, by an extension of Maxi Riley equation for finite size uh, particles that we developed in this paper and we have called it BOM, Berombera Olascoa Miron, BOM. And then we added in this other paper elastic connections through a Hooke's law. And uh, thanks to the property that I just described, we have the theorem. Basically it says that uh, independent of the rotation of the vortex, either cyclonic or anticyclonic uh, networks of uh, floating particles connected by elastic bands are going to be attracted into these uh, coherent Lagrangian vortices because the coherent Lagrangian vortices also finite time attractors for these uh, objects in there. Uh, okay, so these vortices should collect uh, sargassum according to this theory, explaining why sargassum is being uh, attracted into these vortices. Okay, uh, and in here, there are two, uh, um, I, I wanna show you numerically the, uh, the result of, of this uh, theorem. Uh, for the case of a, of a cyclonic, um, cyclonic vortex and then it's a cyclonic one. In blue, we have particles that are moved around by the Maxi Riley equation or the Bohm equation, but without the elastic interaction. Okay, and you see that they tend to be collected into, I mean, the initial, I'm not sure in the initial condition, but it's outside or nearby the vortex. They tend to be collected into anticyclonic vortices. And we have observations for that, that the blue stuff tend to be collected into anticyclonic vortices but they tend to be repelled away from the cyclonic ones. And there are measurements of plastics uh, that support that, that, uh, that observation. Um, and, and there's a theorem for that as well that I'm not uh, showing here. 
But the interest in here is in the red ones. These are the ones that have elastic connections. In here, you don't see any difference because the two are collected into anticyclonics. But in here, they tend to be collected into cyclonics too. Okay, so um, and this is actually we, we push I um, mean the boundaries of, of the theorem here because the theorem holds if the winds are sufficiently calm. But here we put the the winds that were available uh, during the time that we have altimetry to compute the velocity field. So this is I mean a test of a, of a theorem beyond actually the, uh, the the limits of the theorem. So we have sargassum collecting into cyclonic or anticyclonic vortices while individual particles do not do it. Uh, the need or uh, possibly a feature or not is that uh, the center of mass of, 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 of these systems is independent of elastic forces. Because I mean, when you sum over all the elastic forces, they cancel. And then the, the, the center of gravity of, of the blue or the red are gonna be in the same, in the same place. Uh, whether that is a feature or a problem with our theory, we don't know. We like it because we can explain this type of behavior. Okay, and more, more details into this thing. What we need, what we mean by the Maxi Riley theory, we are not um, familiar with that. It was devised by Maxi and Riley, and it's, it's, a, it's a Newton's second law uh, with several forces flow, force, added mass flow, least drag and hold for small particles that are immersed in, in the fluid. Okay, the BOM equation uh, extends this idea to floating particles. So they float at the interface between the ocean and the atmosphere. So you have the air flowing above the ocean and the currents in the ocean. And so we went in there and we took an average of that and we came up with, with a system of equations, okay? And then these two systems have, from a dynamical system point of view, a property of being a, a geometric singular perturbation problem because it involves a fast and a slow uh, variable and the existence of a, of a globally attracting, normally attracting slow manifold. So for sufficiently slow um, uh, particles, there is this manifold that attracts the solution. So instead of having four, n plus one is time, four times n is the number of particles, four times is because we have an equation for the positions and for the, for the velocities, you can reduce that to two n plus one uh, dynamical system only for the, for the positions, which in practice is better because you don't know the initial velocity of the particles. But these control the evolution when you are in the slow manifold. And this is what we need in order to be able to prove uh, the theorem and basically the the sketch of the proof is in here. So we take the velocity of this, we integrate it over, over time, and this is Liouville's theorem. We look for the sign of this. Okay, so the, the, the conclusions that, uh, that I show in, in, in the theorem come from, from, from making this quantity negative. And the what conditions that happen. So as for, for the um, cargo and the carriers, in red, um, we are depicting here over many years of altimetry. Uh, I think since 2011 is the time when the sargassum, uh, I mean, uh, problem started. Uh, and the cyclonic vortices is traversing the uh, Caribbean Sea and the cyclonic ones in, in blue. Uh, actually, there are red and black. These are all the anticyclonic ones and these are all the cyclonic ones. But I'm depicting in color only the ones that we have been able to see that they are able to attract sargassum by looking at images of, of uh, sargassum. So they, they cannot verify the theory beyond just one example that we have uh, given uh, in the interaction of, 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 of this uh, talk. And now we go into the mechanism for the um, spreading or the inundation of sargassum. Okay. Uh, as I said, the Caribbean Sea, I mean, an idealization for that is this rectangle over here, is this box, it's periodic in this direction. And you have flat bottom deep here, and we put a linear uh, uh, in decreasing uh, depth, started at the middle of this uh, channel. 
in here for two situations uh, in which we have a quasi geotrophic system. Uh, you see kind of an Euler two dimensional equation with growth force for those who are familiar with oceanography. And uh, we have two layers. Okay. And the top layer is thin relative to the layer at the bottom. And that is based on observation that these Caribbean seas tend to be uh, shallow. Okay. If the density <coughs> of a system is constant, the upper and the lower layer, uh, according to Glenn Fleer and Adams, uh, these uh, vortices uh, should not fill the topography. And this is what is shown in this, in this uh, simulation in here. So we start with a Gaussian vortex. Actually, we, then we went in there and we extracted the coherent Lagrange vortex and we keep track of that. And you see that the, the, they don't, I mean, the vortex doesn't actually really fill pretty much the topography. So it's a known result. <clears throat> but, and this is not what happens. In, in the KMC. So we went in there and put uh, lateral uh, temperature variation in the top layer. Okay, and so when you do that, you see that the board start to filament in there. So we explain that as a result of thermal instability following Vladimir Zeitlin's uh, notation. Okay. So the neat thing of this is that uh, the system is actually, I mean, this minimal model for the Caribbean Sea dynamics is, is uh, when it has unique solutions, it's a Lipasson Hamiltonian uh, system. And it's a special case of, a, of an extended family of thermal shallow water models with geometry that I developed in, in, in this paper. In here, you wanna give more details on that. So we have this couple system of, 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 of the quasi geotrophic equations I'm highlighting in, in boxes, the ones that you don't have, you don't have a thermal variation in the upper layer. <clears throat> when you leave the vent, <clears throat> you have an equation for the temperature in the, in the upper layer. And this is the invariability principle, the quasi geotrophic potential vorticity. In here, we have a temperature kind of uh, term in there, and we have a uh, topographic beta beta. Uh, effect in here. Okay, so this is Hamiltonian, and and the next thing is that uh, it's uh, it's uh, from the geometric structure. It involves a direct product of the uh, of the algebra of the low beta uh, reduced magneto hydrodynamic uh, with uh, the algebra of the two dimensional incompressible Euler equation, which is the, uh, the algebra of um, uh, area preserving diffeomorphisms in here. So semi-direct product with a, sim with a direct product in here, semi-direct product with functions. Yes. Yeah, yeah, this is all quasi-geotrophic. It's all quasi-geotrophic, even, even it, it, and it's still incompressible uh, because, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. We, this is a quasi geotrophic approximation of the thermal version of it, which is written for uh, primitive equations, which are compressible. Okay, but for carrying out the simulations, it's better to work in quasi geotrophic limit because I meant just to a spectral um, numerical code to run the simulation. So the, the basic uh, takeaway in, of, of this a message of this. Uh, uh, talk for practitioners actually is that uh, in order to forecast sargassum coastal arrivals, it's good to take a look at these uh, vortices. Not at the vortices that you can detect directly from streamlines of Cicero height, but these special vortices because they, they tend to attract sargassum and eventually become unstable and they will spread all, all the sargassum into, into the coast. Um, for theoreticians, we still have this, this open question. How is that uh, these vortices, these very special vortices that have this material boundary that resist um, the formation uh, are formed out of completely incoherent uh, uh, water. Uh, so this is it.
Thank you for your attention.